anytime he comes on the show, makes us smarter. Uh, loved chatting always with this man and thrilled that he is back here on the show with a lot popping in the association. Uh, the man from the worldwide leader in sports on the Mercedes-Benz Vans phone line, Brian Windhorst, back here on the program. How you doing, Brian? Hi, Rich. How are you? I'm doing fine. So what is the latest from your uh, end of things on what's going on with Durant, the Celtics, and uh, anything else on that front, Brian? Yeah, I know. Obviously, this comes out today from Woj, and so it's the front of everybody's mind. My feel is that those talks are not brand new, that the, the Celtics have been talking to the, to the Nets all along. Um, when they offered uh, Jalen Brown, I don't know when that was, but it wasn't yesterday or the day before. That's, uh, that offer's been there for a while. And the thing about it is, Rich, we're in such – this Durant situation is so different from all the star players who've asked for trades for the last decade because he's got four years on his contract. It's not like when Anthony Davis asked. It's not like when Kawhi Leonard asked. It's just different, and there's not a playbook for it. And so the Nets, because of that, are asking an obscene price. And so let's just go to our lives, whether we're ever in the bidding for something or we watch things, what happens when something is so expensive nobody wants to pay? You know, a Bugatti somebody found in a barn or, you know, oceanfront real estate in Santa Monica that the price is so high. One of two things happen. It either sits on the market and doesn't get sold or the price drops. And if you're if you don't want to pay the price and you're in the market for it, you wait for the price to drop. And that is exactly what's happening with Durant. There is this something that is extremely valuable on the market and nobody wants to pay the price for it. And so they are now waiting for it to drop and the Nets are just waiting for someone to come up. And this is the stalemate for a high, you know, highly valued uh, NBA player. Well, I, I totally get that, Brian. I totally understand. Why would the Celtics be willing to part with Jalen Brown, do you think? on that front? So this is a nuanced answer. Um, Jalen Brown has a contract that is, he's very likely not going to extend. Um, he is, you know, in the NBA, you can, when you, when you're in a contract and you want to extend your contract, as we just recently saw, for example, with Devin Booker and Carl Anthony Towns, you can only extend your contract a certain percentage. It's one of the arcane rules. And so even if Jalen Brown was over the moon, excited with the Celtics, even if they had gone 82 and 0 last year and he had averaged 50 points a game and shot 100% <laughs> from the field. And he was telling people that he never wants to leave the city of Boston again in his life. He would not extend his contract because his contract that he's in right now limits how much he can extend for. So the Celtics, as they look long-term, are probably facing Jalen Brown eventually becoming an unrestricted free agent on them in two years and them not having control over where he's going to go. It is a, you know, on the grand scheme of problems confronting the Celtics, it's not sitting there on the front burner, but it is something that is an issue out there. By the way, this is exactly... The, you know, the core reason why the San Antonio Spurs traded DeJounte Murray, you may have said to yourself, my God, why would they trade uh, an all-star in the middle of his contract who's in his prime? And that's the reason is that they were afraid they couldn't keep him and you trade him when his value is highest. So I don't think that the Celtics are sitting there scheming about where they can trade Jalen Brown. Oh, my God, we got to trade him. I think they realize that there is a coming issue with his contract. And if you're ever going to trade him, why would you not trade him to get a player in Kevin Durant who could take you closer to a championship? I don't think they're making calls offering Jalen Brown around. But when this offer presented itself or this situation, I think they, w they were remiss not to at least explore it. It doesn't mean they don't like him. Of course, I understand that that will be the premise out there, that you know, once something like this gets out there, that it's like, oh, my God, they want to get rid of him. They hate him. You know, He's going to get rid of the next five minutes. He wants out of there. That's not necessarily true. But I realize that it's all buried in nuance and it's not always going to get translated. Brian Windhorst here on the Rich Eisen Show. And uh, honestly, I, and I also get you saying that, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dance between hoping that the price drops if you do want Durant and hoping that uh, you can get through that period uh, if you're the Nets. 
Any chance that the Nets have told Durant, forget it, you're staying here, we want you? Is that Has that been a, a possibility at all? I think the Nets' position at the moment, Rich, and I mean, I really have to say at the moment because this is somewhat volatile, although I think it's dormant right now, but I think their position is we can't get our price for you, so – we're going to try to run this back and see if we can do it better. There is precedent for something like this. Uh, 2007, Kobe Bryant asked for a trade. In fact, if you remember, he went on Stephen A. Smith's show on national television and said the word, something to the effect of, I never am going to play for the Lakers again. I've asked them for a trade. And the late, now at that time, Kobe, he might as well have had a four-year contract because he had a no trade clause in his contract. He was able to veto any trade and the Lakers went out and looked for offers, specifically with the Bulls. And they said, okay, Kobe, we're going to trade you the Bulls for these players. And Kobe said, no, you can't trade me for those players because then when I go to Chicago, we won't be good enough. And they went around and around and around like this throughout the summer. And eventually they said, Kobe, you're under contract. We can't find a trade. Let's just try to work this out. And Kobe came back, and later they traded for Paul Gasol, and they went to the next three finals. So I think, you know, there is precedent. Now, the, the, the reality, Rich, is that, Kevin Durant was the one who started this. He was the one who requested the trade. It is he who will decide whether or not he remains pleased with the situation. But it's the same sort of deal. No team feels ready to offer the price that the Nets want for Durant. And so, again, if you can't get your price, I think it's common if you were trying to sell something that had extreme value to you and you couldn't get your price, you're more likely to just pull it off the market as opposed to making a bad deal. So I think that's where the Nets are right now. We don't know where Durant is on that. Durant is tweeting about things that are not related (laughs) to his situation. He is not sharing where his feelings are on that. But I think that's where the Nets are right now. They are not getting the offers that they deem worth his value. And so I think they're like, look, we've got you under contract for four years. Let's try to see if we can work this out in September. And then, of course, in the interim, uh, you know, a lot of folks, Brian Windhorst, attempting to CSI to uh, hit the DNA and on the decision by Durant to ask for the trade out of Brooklyn and that being made public two days after Kyrie Irving opts back in with Brooklyn. And there's a lot of uh, connecting those dots that uh, Kyrie says, I'm back. And then Durant says, I'm out. Is that is that correlated? In your mind, are those are those two things mutually exclusive, or is that a direct line? Kyrie says, I want back, and Durant says, I want out. What do you think? Well, one of the things that we do know, Rich, is that um, Durant and Kyrie were talking during, Durant's, uh, during Kyrie's negotiation for his contract. Uh, we know this because Kevin said as much. Uh, in the last his last comments on the situation, he did a podcast on his podcast network and and said he was communicating with Kyrie, although he said he wasn't telling him what to do. He was standing back. So I doubt I don't know for sure. OK, to be 100 percent clear, I don't know for sure. I mm-hmm. didn't tap their phone line, mm-hmm. but I doubt that Kevin's trade demand came as a surprise to Kyrie Irving. Um, but I do think that Kyrie was worried about making the best deal for himself. And considering there was no way he was going to get that $37 million out on the market, not so much because nobody valued him, but it was just that there wasn't teams with cap space this summer who needed a player like him or in position to go for a player like him. I think he made his mind up relative to his own situation. But having said that, I don't think that the Nets, do something with Kyrie Irving until they know what's happening with Durant. Because at the end of the day, if the smoke clears and they still have Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving on their roster, right. they've got a very formidable team. Now, yeah. whether they can hold it together is a different question. Yes. And the crazy thing about this is, Rich, I know that this statement is going to sound wild I'm about to make, but I actually like the Nets off season to this point. <laughs> they have added... <laughs> they have added a couple of nice veterans. Um, they they traded for Royce O'Neal from the uh, from the uh, from the Jazz, yes. who is the exact type of player they need. Who is a defensive three point shooter. Um, they're going to get they're going to get healthier. Some of their players who were out last year are going to be healthier coming back. They're going to have great shooting 
on their team. Um, I, I think they could be pretty darn good if they could hold it all together. Of course, the holding it all together is the problem. Brian Windhorst here on the Rich Eisen Show. So you just mentioned Royce O'Neal, the acquisition for the Nets from uh, from the Jazz, and that uh, leads me to your, uh, I think, very viral moment, Brian, uh, from a couple weeks ago where you went on in what I thought was a very uh, rust cold, true detective-type soliloquy on <laughs> <laughs> time as a flat circle, watch the Jazz, you th- you, I keep an eye on the Jazz, yeah. and then boom, uh, we, we saw Rudy Gobert get traded later on that night. Uh, your phone must have blown up on that. You see all the memes, too, with the pointing and the fingers and all that business? Brian, you see that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think – I mean, the situation was this, Rich. I, I knew that Rudy Gobert was very close to getting traded. But, you know, I wasn't 100% sure he was going to get traded because, obviously, that was a pretty uh, complicated, wild deal. But when I – knowing that G- Gobert was about to go traded and having seen that Royce O'Neal trade, which was indicating – that potentially two superstars or stars were about to be on the market. Um, that was sort of my way of, <laughs> of, of telling the viewer. And, you know, the, the first letter in ESPN does stand for entertainment. Yes. Right? We like to sometimes. I know that, I know that it's taboo to do anything too, too edgy, but sometimes we try to have a modicum, just a, a little teeny bit of fun, teeny bit of fun. We're allowed to have, um, we're not descended on like locusts by aggregators. <laughs> and so um, I was trying to, you know, I was trying to avoid coming out and saying Rudy Gobert is about to get traded. Because yes. if I had said that, <laughs> then I would have been married to that. And for the next 72 hours, um, there would have been an, an all out attack coming at me from 15 different sides demanding Rudy Gobert updates and information. Brian, what is the very, 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 very latest on the Rudy Gobert trade talks? And I just didn't want that in my life because I also knew that there's a possibility he wasn't going to get traded because I thought he was going to get traded the night before, and they didn't put the deal together because, as you later found out, that the deal was pretty complicated. So really what I was just trying to do, number one, was have some fun because, Rich, the A block of first take lasts about 25 minutes. You know, you have a little bit of time there. And Stephen A. was out. He was he was he was on. He was out yeah. that week. So you know Stephen A. wasn't there. And so like I had a little bit of time. I was just trying to have a little bit of fun, without going too far with what I said. And I guess people liked it. And it also helped that it was Friday of a holiday weekend yes. where the holiday was on Monday. So it was a long weekend where not much happened and people were able to have fun on the internet. It was riveting television, Brian. And I love that there was a method to the madness right there. So <laughs> uh, clearly you're the man to ask what's going on with Donovan Mitchell then is he going or staying? What's the scoop with him? Or is Utah going to end up clearing the yeah. whole deck there? What do you think? Well, let's judge the jazz and the New York Knicks on their actions. Okay. Let's, Let's take the words and just ignore them because the Jazz were telling people openly, yes. we're not going to trade Rudy Gobert. And then they were saying, we're not going to trade Donovan Mitchell. And I don't know if their credibility is the greatest right now. So if you look at what Danny Ainge has traded stars for, whether it was Kevin uh, Garnett and Paul Pierce or now Rudy Gobert, his price is awfully high. And you saw what he just got for Gobert. It was a, a haul, one of the highest um, uh, price trades in NBA history, uh, right up there with Paul George. But, of course, the Paul George one has a bit of an asterisk on it because the Clippers were kind of trading for Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. This, for a single-player acquisition, is just absolutely breathtaking. So – with that is what you know about Danny Ainge, I think you can rest assured that he is not going to trade Donovan Mitchell until he gets the price that he has in his mind. And that could come tomorrow. I doubt it. That could come in a month. That could come in three months. He has Donovan Mitchell under contract for four years. Hmm. And from what I am, from what I understand, Donovan Mitchell, while he recognizes that he doesn't want to be on a total rebuilding team, which is where the Jazz are headed, he is not forcing the issue. I think he is not. Uh, I think he realizes he's probably going to get traded at some point, and anything that he does to cause waves might delay that uh, or complicate it. And so he is planning on, um, you know, 
being a good professional, reporting, and just waiting to get traded. And so as a result, I think you're going to see it drag out. Now, let's go to the Knicks. Now, granted, it was a different front office, but it was the same owner. This is very mm-hmm. comparable to me to when the Knicks were really wanting to get Carmelo Anthony. If you remember, mm-hmm. that played out over six, seven months, Rich, and we talked about dozens of different trade scenarios, uh, there was times where another team, the Brooklyn, or I guess the New Jersey Nets at the time, maybe they'd moved to Brooklyn, uh, were, you know, almost traded for him. And at the end of the day, the Knicks basically paid a massive amount for Carmelo Anthony. They ended up giving the the, the Nuggets just about everything that they wanted. Um, and so if you're Danny Ainge and you know that that's what the Knicks and the same ownership might do, uh, and you have held your price out, I think what you will see there is, because the Knicks have, I know there are other teams interested, but what the price that the Jazz are looking for, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of that four first-round picks um, that they got for Gobert and then other players, uh, I think the Knicks are the team that can pay it. I think the Knicks are the team that the Jazz uh, want to do the business with, and I think uh, you know the Knicks, uh, ultimately will probably feel some pressure to execute that deal, especially if the season starts and they don't start out super hot. Mm-hmm. So um, I would mm-hmm. guess that eventually Donovan Mitchell is a Nick. That's a, that's a educated guess. I don't know, of course. And I think it's really right now all about the two sides doing their own posturing and negotiation on what the price is going to be. Brian Windhorst here on the Rich Eisen Show. In the couple minutes I have left, one last tea leaf read from you, Brian Windhorst. Uh, And this is involving Russell Westbrook and his agent breaking up. Now, normally I don't pay attention to that sort of stuff, but there was a very compelling statement put out by his former agent of 14 years saying that the trade that Westbrook might um, need to get out of Los Angeles would require uh, additional value, Uh, meaning, you know, everybody's saying the Lakers have got to include first-round draft choices and they're not going to do that. Even then, such a trade may require Russell to immediately move on from the new team via buyout. This is from the statement saying that the agent's belief is that this type of transaction only serves to diminish Russell's value and his best option is to stay with the Lakers and embrace the starting role and support that Darvin Ham publicly offered. And then they broke up saying that's an irreconcilable difference. Does that mean Russ wants out? Is that what you're, is that what we're to read here? And what's going on, Brian? I don't know if he wants out. I think what seems to be clear from that statement, which Rich, I agree. I've never seen anything like it in the 20 years I've covered the NBA and his agent, his now ex agent, Thad Fauche, is a veteran longtime agent. The guy's done, I don't want to shortchange him, maybe he's done a billion dollars in deals, uh, maybe more. Uh, he is not uh, he, he is not without experience. And so I think the most interesting thing about that is that what basically Thad is saying there is that if Russ gets traded, he's being traded basically just as a contract and that he will be likely released by his new team because mm. his only value is as a is as a cap clearer is is, a, is you know is a, is a con, is a is a accounting move and that he's saying basically without saying it that the the off the the role that Darvin Ham is 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 offering him which is as a starting point guard but as a role player Darvin Ham has pretty much spelled out exactly what he wants from him uh is better than he could get if he gets traded I'm not sure that I'm not sure that if Russell Westbrook was traded to a team and released tomorrow, I'm not sure that he would have a team right away. Wow. I think he would eventually get back into the league, but I think this concept that people would immediately want to sign him, and again, it's not so much that people don't – I know that there are, there are Russ fans out there, Rich, who find this absolutely an insult, and I'm sure Russ himself clearly doesn't believe this because he's fired his agent uh, over it. Um, but it's not so much what his uh, what his abilities are. It's what he's willing to do for a team. It's what he it's what his um, you know what he's willing to accept as a role in more than his actual skills. And so that's where the Lakers are trying to trying to squeeze him into a box. I don't think it will be successful, Rich, um, because I think what Darvin Ham is asking him to do, which is to set screens, 
uh, play um, defense first and stand in the corner and be a floor spacer. I don't think he's equipped to do that. And maybe if he worked tirelessly over the summer, maybe he would have a shot at it. But it sounds like he's spending more time trying to break out of that situation than to fall into it. And my question is, if Russ doesn't embrace what Darvin Ham has put in front of him, and it's, it seems like he's not based on what Sad uh, Fauche said in that statement, what do the Lakers do? If he's not willing to accept the role, how do they, how do they approach him mm-hmm. in the season if they can't trade him? Because trading him is complicated. He makes $47 million. <laughs> it's hard to find a trade. I mean, there's, there are trades out there they can do. I'm not saying that's impossible. And they've, they're exploring them, and maybe they'll find something. But if he's not willing to fill that role, what do you do? Do you even bring him to camp? And so Russ is on the edge right now. It could go a multitude of different ways. But I would say that that statement and that breakup um, did not help the Lakers, either with their relationship with Russ, with Darvin Ham's hopes of getting him into that role, or in their hopes of trading him. Yeah, because, I mean, why why break up with your agent when you said Fauche, you know, is good, you don't want to shortchange him a billion dollars worth of contracts. You could say that it, the, that's all Westbrook's money, right? So <laughs> it's insane how successful this relationship is and for the agent to basically come out and say, I'm telling him to stay, and this is an irreconcilable difference, we're done. I mean, that is what more of an indication you need to know that Westbrook isn't buying what Ham is selling. Right. I mean, and I, I, I don't know how that's tenable I, I for the know, Lakers. Yeah. yeah, I don't know exactly why Thad did that, but I almost think it was him trying to help Russ. Right. You yeah. know, him trying to, to, to just say, Russ, like this is this is where it is. But, you know, from what I understand, Russ is out there shopping for a new agent and he's looking at big names. And if he lands a big name agent, what is he going to task that agent to do? Why go out and hire another agent? You know, you know what's you know what is the new agent going to ask for that Thad Fauche wouldn't do? So that's like, you, like you're jumping to a conclusion that it might mean leaving the Lakers. I don't want to jump to that conclusion, but you're not you're not you're not ridiculous in saying that. Brian, thanks for the time, man. Really love the chat again. Um, you never disappoint. You always over deliver. Greatly appreciate it. Let's chat again soon. Look for my text. Look for my call. Okay, talk to you later. Thanks again, man. That's uh, at Windhorse DSPN. The best. Love him.